What does that mean? Does it mean something? Turn, if you would, in your Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter number 17. Appreciate all the singing this morning. It's been good so far. Let's stand in, uh, to our feet, and we'll just read a few verses here from Exodus chapter number 17. We're going to begin uh, in this particular passage of Scripture only as a starting point. This isn't the, the sermon isn't going to be based on this text exactly, but it is important to understand something, um, where we're going and kind of what happens next. So we're going to read verses number 8 through 13. And I wrote it down in my notes in advance so I wouldn't have to get up here and try to decide which verses to read. But in verse number 8, we read this, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And, J and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven." And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, for he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Our Father and our God, we are grateful to you this morning for these things you have preserved in your word, and of course, once again, for the strength and ability you've given us to gather together here, that we might be further perfected through the preaching of the word, the work of your spirit, the communion of the saints, the fellowship of the brethren, the love of Christ working in our hearts. And Father, this morning we just pray that he might be lifted up and glorified in our sight in this place, and that your Spirit would move among the hearts of your people, Father, to provoke us unto love and good works, that we might continue in the faith and all of the scriptural admonitions that we are given for our furtherance uh, in the ministry and for the furtherance of the gospel in this world. Father, we pray that these things might be accomplished in us and through us on the behalf of Christ and for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated then. Very familiar passage of scripture of Moses going up to this hill and, and being seated there and the battle with Joshua and Amalek and deserves some good preaching on its own right. And uh, I think Brother Gibson has talked about uh, a sermon that he either preached or heard preached one time on this text that uh, the title of the sermon was, We Need More Men Like Her. Uh, and that's speaking specifically to the role that Her, uh, her played with Moses as he and Aaron were on either side of Moses holding up his hands so that the battle might go in favor. Now, it's kind of an odd thing. You would think, um, you know, you put yourself in the situation where you read these accounts in Scripture and we think, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And by, by the grace of God, we have uh, every reason to believe uh, for many reasons that that is exactly what happened. But at the same time, if you're the guy... Uh, fighting on behalf of Israel and you're down in the trenches swinging swords and doing battle with Amalek it's a little odd to think that the fate of this battle as you're down there actually in the fight uh, that ultimately this is being decided by some old guy up on a hill who's holding a stick in the air You're like well what does that have to do with what I'm because I'm actually doing the fighting but he's the one up there and whether or not he's holding up the rod is how this is going Right? And there's a lot of things pictorially represented in that, that we oftentimes, uh, we are not, just to be clear, I think it should be obvious, we are not the guy up on the hill with the rod. We are the soldiers who are in the fight, and we actually have to do the fighting. But ultimately, the outcome isn't really predicated on our ability to fight. We still are called to the fight. And so we're engaged in the battle, and this is the scene. That, but, but as this is playing out, Aaron and her uh, are on either side of Moses and holding up his hands so that his hands would be steady and that Israel would prevail in battle over their enemies. And we find these two men, Aaron and her, being preached on a lot in this text. And so the question I have for you this morning, as we just flip a few pages to the right, I'm not going to lay a lot of groundwork there because I'm going to... 
operate on the assumption that most of you are somewhat familiar with that story. And so you've got Aaron and Hur, and these are the men that come along beside Moses, the servant of God, to steady his hands and to hold up his hands, and they're standing by Moses. They're doing the work of God, and they're fulfilling their God-given roles, you know, seeing to it that the work of God is accomplished. And most of the sermons that we've probably heard about her have been in that context. And so I want to talk to you this morning. What I said last Sunday uh, would be maybe just a fun little title at least. Uh, but how do we go from her to nowhere? Uh, from her, that's Oki. That's an Oki preacher titling his sermon, From Her to Nowhere. And I'm not really even really very good at titling sermons. And most of you by now are thinking, please don't title your sermons anymore. <laughs> Uh, because when you do, it's terrible, and we're all <laughs> terrified at where this is going. But if we just turn a few pages to the right, uh, we find her mentioned in another context, and this is almost never spoken of. And I, I often find it uh, helpful to not preach on um, you know, things that are silent in Scripture, but sometimes, as this old saying goes, silence is deafening. And I think that that's exactly what we have in this case. We're all familiar with uh, this other story as well, but maybe not as familiar with the role that her had in the situation, or maybe we might rather say the role that he didn't play in the situation. And so we're going to find this account in the book of Exodus, chapter number uh, 24. We'll begin our reading in verse number 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. Pretty straightforward. It's uh, how the Lord speaks to his servant. Amen. And I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, you might recognize him, he was the one who was leading the armies of Israel against Amalek. So Moses rises up with his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, who? Aaron and her are with you. What's the charge? If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Now, this makes perfect sense. Apparently, uh, we've just come off of a great battle, a great victory, and Moses had these two men standing faithfully at his side. Uh, and so, it seems to make sense, right? That now Moses is going to be gone for a few days. He's taking an extended trip up to the mountain to appear before God, to receive the laws and the covenant uh, from God for the people of Israel so that he can come back and teach it to them. And so he says, I'm going to be gone for just a few days. It's interesting that he didn't say, you guys will be fine. It's only going to be a short trip, right? No, he... He took extra steps to say, specifically, here's the deal. I'm going to be gone, but Aaron and who? Her. They're going to be here. So if anybody needs anything, who are they supposed to go talk to? Aaron and her. Why? Because these are the two faithful guys that Moses was counting on to stand in the gap while he's away and again, this makes perfect sense. Coming off this great victory, a lot of confidence in these guys now. They've stood by Moses, and they've been a help to Moses, and they've been an encouragement to Moses. They've seen the hand of God, the work of God. And so Moses takes those same two guys, and he says, Okay, here they are. If you guys need anything, come talk to them. Now, if we continue our reading, we'll find that Moses does go up to the mountain, and there's quite a few chapters uh, of discussion, uh, some of the things that are recorded particularly, but if we read all the way over to uh, chapter number 32, we are panning now in our vision, right? We've gone up to the mount with uh, Moses to meet God and receive the commandments, and now the, the scripture is taking us back, kind of panning back to the people, because this is how the narrative is unfolding. Moses is away, the people are sitting down here uh, waiting. What, what had Moses told them? Just wait till we come back. Now, is that hard to do? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of Saul and Samuel, right? What did Samuel tell Saul? Wait for me. 
And then Saul did what? He couldn't wait, right? And he began to act uh, on his own volition, trying to figure it out. Well, same thing here. Moses says, just wait for us. We will come back. And then we begin the period of waiting. And this apparently doesn't last very long before the people get a little antsy. Because after all, for everyone who thinks they really want just a day off, right? Well, these people, they now don't have jobs. They don't have careers. They're wandering in the wilderness. They're pilgrims. They don't have any occupation. Uh, and so they're like, well, what? now what? So verse number uh, one of chapter number 32, we find when the people, what? Saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. You could say that this is also a good picture of uh, what the Lord says will happen as people wait for his return, for him to come back down from heaven, uh, from the presence of God. As he delays, uh, as we see it, then people are going to get a little restless in the faith and begin to corrupt themselves. Uh, and so they see that he's delayed. And so the people gather themselves together unto who? Aaron. And said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears, uh, in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of, Egypt, out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. You might say that sounds an awful lot like modern Christianity, right? And so this is the scene. This is what's going on now. Who is obviously and conspicuously absent from the entire ordeal? What's the deal? He's nowhere. That's exactly right, which is why I titled this sermon, in case you missed it, <laughs> From Her to Nowhere. How do you go from being the guy who's standing right by Moses and holding up his hands? And we, we throw a lot of blame, and rightfully so, because Moses blamed Aaron as well. But it's interesting, as you, as you listen to this whole thing, it's not that he's not involved. It's just we don't have any, there's no record of his involvement. And that is the, the topic of this morning's sermon is, you know, what does it look like to be absent in your role that you're called to? I think from a leadership standpoint, whether that's a leadership uh, in the church or whether it's leadership in the home or it's leadership in the workplace, uh, there's all kinds of varieties of bad leadership, right? And it's sometimes hard to tell if somebody is simply negligent of the responsibilities they actually have or if they're just distracted with other things, and so they're not getting around to that one. But as I said in the bulletin, in the little summary, in either case, to the people that are following, it looks the same because they don't know the difference, right? Your children don't know the difference whether you are distracted from your responsibilities or if you're just negligent of your duty. It looks the same. And in every case, in the roles that we are given to occupy, uh, it looks the same, and the outcome is the same. And it leaves me kind of wondering as I read this account, and I see Moses putting uh, her in this position, that her did have a voice to be used. He was acknowledged by Moses as being one of the top two guys that the entire multitude of the nation of Israel was supposed to look to for guidance. And you can't help but wonder, where is he? What's he doing? Why is he not speaking up? Why isn't he assuming the responsibility that he was given? And so for all of the accolades we sometimes want to heap on men that we find in Scripture, Scripture is always really clear to bring them back down to us and show us they are men. Because we ought not glory in men. You know, you'll hear about heroes of the faith. I don't think there are any heroes of the faith. There are witnesses to the faith. 
But in every case, these heroes, actually we see that they're just men. That's what the Bible tells us about the prophet Elijah. He's a like man of, of similar passions as you and I. He's, he's a guy. He lived a life. He had relationships. He ate food. He drank water. He got tired. He, he might have even got hangry, Nathan. We don't know. But whatever the issues, he's a guy with issues. And guess what? People, they have issues. And so we sometimes get this picture of her like he's someone we should aspire to be like. And then you read a little further and you're like, well, I don't know. Maybe he's not someone we should aspire to be like. Because I don't think in this moment that at least as far as the record of Scripture shows us that his influence was felt at all. And really, that's all leadership is. Leadership, and I'm, I'm not preaching on leadership this morning, but every one of you, in certain, a certain sense, are in a leadership role. Leadership is simply the ability to have influence. It's not a position. It's not, it's not a le- authority. It's not power. It's influence. It's your ab- ability to have influence with other people. And in this moment, what I find with her is he's completely absent the scene. And so it really begs the question for us, why does so often throughout Scripture the Bible encourage us a couple of things, but especially to leaders, it speaks very clearly, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. We sometimes think that means take heed to make sure we don't do something we ought not do. But it's also take heed that you do actually engage in the things that require your engagement. That there's things, I'm I'm sure as parents in our homes, there are things getting past us because we are just not paying attention. Right? And so when you read this account, I just want you to imagine, like if I said, where is her? I'm not saying where is she. I'm saying where is her? Where is he? He was left in charge. He was supposed to be responsible. He was a trusted counselor, a go-to guy. And yet through the entire account, he has no influence. Completely absent, uh, not doing any of the things that he's supposed to do. So the person that seems to be front and center is Aaron. Did Aaron feel uh, alienated? Did, Did Aaron feel the pressure because somebody else wasn't there to stand with him in the moment? You know, sometimes it's hard to tell how much damage we can do by doing nothing. We don't know how this story, obviously, it was never going to play out differently, but you just don't know it from a human perspective as we uh, were to go to bed on this night, right? If we had been here and we were to go to bed that night and we begin to wrestle with our own uh, involvement and we were to, if we were her, for example, and we began to ask, How could today have looked differently if only I had fill in the blank? If only I had strengthened the hands of Aaron like I stood with Moses. If I hadn't allowed, right? It's one thing to be up on the hill viewing the battle from a distance and feel a lot of confidence to stand with God. It's another thing to be surrounded by a mob of people who are putting a lot of pressure on you to abandon your God. And her seemed to do pretty well on the hilltop and at a distance. It's not much different than maybe coming into the assembly and saying amen, and and it's great, and it's easy, but then you go back out, and you're disengaged, you're uninvolved, right? Things are happening all around you, and you're just not paying attention. You're not plugged in. You're not contributing. you're You're not living up to the responsibilities that God has placed right at your doorstep. It's a different thing, right, from the hilltop to being in this moment. So her, what could have been different? Could he have helped Aaron? Could he have been a voice of reason? Could he have been a voice for truth, a voice for righteousness, like we heard about in Sunday school? What opportunities did he miss? And what was he doing that was, like, (laughs) I want to know, what was he doing? Because my guess is, It was probably just something as silly and ridiculous as the kind of things that distract us from what we ought to be doing. And so God has given us much to do, right? And so you think about her. Moses had entrusted him with much, put a good deal in his hands. 
And it's not enough to just think God's in charge, it'll be okay. God's sovereign, it'll be whatever he says. God's providential, he's going to take care of it all. And so I don't know, that's not enough. You've got to plug in, you have to engage, you have to own it. And her was not able, nor was Aaron able, to stand before Moses and say, well, God's sovereign. I mean, it's what was supposed to come to pass. That's what came to pass. No, there was a great cost to be paid. Many people lost their lives, and you could say needlessly, because of the failure of those who were in leadership to be responsible with the duties they had been given. And so my appeal this morning is to all of us in whatever capacity that you are given responsibility by God, plug in, get involved. It is not going to wash that God's sovereign and so I don't have to do my job. Her her had every opportunity, both legitimately and through the influence he had with, with the people, he had every opportunity to make a difference. And in the moment when it really mattered, we just don't find him mentioned at all. Maybe he was on vacation, you know, taking some PTO. We don't know. But it's just, it's, it's deafening with its silence that Moses is very clear. Aaron and her are here. It's interesting, as, God sent, as uh, Jesus Christ sent out the disciples, he often sends them two by two. As if to say, you're going to need a brother. Amen. Right? You're, not, you're not created to live, right? Think about God himself. If we're created in his image, God lives in perfect fellowship, Father, Son, and Spirit. It doesn't even make sense for us to think we don't need people. That's right. That's good. And so the Lord sends out his apostles two by two and says, you're going to need that. You're going to need the brother. You're going to need the accountability. You're going to need the encouragement. You're going to need the work of the Holy Ghost in you both with the disparity of gifts that you each have and enjoy to strengthen one another for the work that is to be done. And in this moment, what we find is one man standing alone and he falls. Aaron was not up to the task alone, but could he have been if he had just had someone standing alongside him as well? Solomon wisely said, yeah, the threefold cord is not quickly broken. So we have Moses and we have Aaron and her, and man, that, that cord is strong. And we removed Moses and he's gone. And, and now the cord's a little weaker, but there's hope it'll stand. But then you remove just one more strand of that cord and you have one man standing alone, and it's as easy as pushing a rope. I mean, it's just for, for the adversary to get the advantage with one guy standing alone doing it on his own, it's, it's just it's a walk in the park. There's no, there's no reason to expect any different outcome. And so God has created things in such a way, and Jesus has ordained the church in such a way that we are to come alongside strengthen one another no one man can do it on his own nor ought he to do it on his own i think this shows us that that wisdom in a practical way that as you begin to peel off strands of that cord and you're down to one guy he folds under pressure and then who's everybody angry with him because it's his responsibility he was the one supposed to stand in the gap And at the end of the day, the pastor is the one who's supposed to be responsible, have the oversight. But the question remains, since he's just the guy, and he's not a hero of any kind in the faith or otherwise, what will happen if you were to strip every other thing away and just leave him standing alone to go toe-to-toe with the adversary? What do you think might be a reasonable outcome to expect? And so I just think this picture is really powerful, and, and I want to contemplate this question, you know, where are you in this story? Are you the people, you know, piling on? Are you Aaron, knowing what's right, but don't have the confidence and strength? Or are you her, and you just know where to be found? You're just, you're just somewhere, but, but 
but not contributing. I mean, there's no notable contribution from her from the moment Moses says, hey, these two guys, we don't hear from them again. Speculation. I don't think Moses put him in charge again. Where were you? And I wonder sometimes when we stand before the Lord, he's, he's not going to be able to ask us that same question. Where were you? Where were you? What, what were you doing? You had everything right there in your hands that I wanted you to do. Where were you, right? MIA. So the story really, I think, speaks to us particularly in any, any capacity of responsibility that we have. Turn, if you would, to the book of Acts. Because you might even ask yourself, if you're her, this is what always happens in, in the realm of human thought. We find every good reason to do something else because we always downplay the potential negative consequences. Right. When Eve was tempted in the garden, did she have a reasoned view of all the potential negatives that could come from this course of action or did she only see the positives she's completely blinded to the reality of the negatives because she can only see how great the positives are and we often think through life that way we are so blinded to the actual consequences of our choices and conduct and actions because we only want to see oh well if i did this this would be great as if there was no no other cost to be paid uh, by going that direction. And so in this area of responsibility, I want to say the converse. As opposed to saying we need more men like her, I want to say don't be like her. Don't be like her. We need people who understand the moment, understand the times, understand the weight that their contribution is able to have, that you can stand for Christ as part of the church community and make a difference in this world for eternity. And you might ask yourself, well, what, what could, what's the worst that could happen? And it's really hard to measure, right, isn't it? It's hard to measure the, um, the power of absence because you're not proactively doing harm. But if you look at the story in the book of Exodus, how do you measure the power of absence? Right, the entire thing just went from, you know, we are the people of God, dancing and singing before the Lord. He just brought us across the Red Sea. And, and all of a sudden now, we've made a golden calf. We've been stripped, uh, you know, we're dancing and playing. And Aaron's made us naked before our enemies to our shame. And uh, it's idolatry at its worst. Uh, and we're, we're behaving just like we were right back in Egypt and we were never delivered at all because in our minds we're still captive to these ideas, to these false religions and these false ways of thinking. So we're really still enslaved. We're just in a different geographical location, uh, but we're still in the same slavery. And so when you think about what's the power of absence, how do you measure the lack of hers contributions? Because all these things flowed from his absence. And so what if he had been involved? What if he had taken a stand? You say, well, the people were set on mischief. They're going to do mischief anyway. Perhaps. But let's not lead them into it by making the calf, right? Let, let's put up a few hurdles and a few obstacles for the sake of uh, right and truth. Uh, and so we go to Acts chapter number 20. I find it interesting that as the Apostle Paul is charging the leaders of the church at Ephesus before his departure. He's, he's tasking them with some very specific things. And in verse number 25, we'll begin our reading. He says, And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Right? Now, this is not the same necessarily as Moses, as far as um, someone who is taken the responsibility of leadership very seriously, and he's trying to equip others to lead well in his absence, right? Moses goes away for a few days. Paul's like, yeah, I'm not, you're not going to see me again. I'm going away, like away, away. And so you won't see me anymore. And so now he's going to begin the process of equipping them. And notice some of the things that he has to say. He says, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Notice what he starts off with then. What is the charge to them? 
Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. It's not until we're taking heed to ourselves that we can ever really think about taking heed to the flock. And the flock in this case, for them, was the church at Ephesus. But the flock in your case can be whatever set of responsibilities that God has given you. The flock might only be a wife. The flock might be whatever uh, children God has given you. The flock might look very different for each of us depending on where we're at in life. But there is a flock. There are responsibilities that you are to tend to with care as a steward of the things of Christ. And so whatever that flock is, as we first think about how do we do that well, it begins with take heed to yourself. Right? And he begins to lay out some of the pitfalls, some of the dangers that, that come along with this territory. He says that the, uh, the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. So what is the responsibility? It's rooted in service. But what ultimately happens, right? We see an opportunity for power. This happens in parenting. This happens in marriages. This happens in churches. This happens in government. It happens in the school board. It happens in city hall. It happens at the state capitol. It happens at the federal level. It happens at the UN. That what is structured to be oriented around service to those for whom you are responsible is ultimately corrupted by those to empower themselves and wield power over people and to... Um, you know, as Adam said it well this morning, you know, someone who is forced to do something against their will is still of the same opinion. They haven't actually changed their mind, even if you're forcing them to do something. But unfortunately, authority turns into power when men get a hold of it rather than responsibility. And so he's saying you need to watch out for that because that's the way natural men tend to think. And he said that you need to be servants, feeding the flock of God, which uh, God has purchased with his own blood. He says, I know this after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. All right. So he's saying there's going to be threats from without. And then also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. In other words, threats from within. And the church has ever faced both that there are threats from without. There are threats from within. And so he's telling them you need to pay attention. Let me tell you this. If you're raising a family, there are threats from without. I shouldn't have to speak very long to convince you of that. Look around in the world and open your eyes and you'll see that there are many threats from without. But I would actually submit to you the greatest threat to your home is from within. Because that is where the greatest damage gets done. It's when people are alienated, hurt, and ruined, and traumatized in the home that they are compelled to look outside of the home for comfort, solace, and companionship and everything else that the home is not affording them that they ought to find in the home. And so we have to have this understanding that we have some responsibility in this, that God has given that to us, and we're to take it very personally. And as we think about her, just don't be like her. Don't be like her. That's really my whole point this morning. I don't know if I've ever preached a sermon from, from silence like that. But as I said, I think it's a deafening silence that her was specifically called out in the scriptures as a man who was responsible for the overseeing the congregation. But when it came to a moment of crisis, he was content to either be unheard or uninvolved. And that's not good enough. Leadership actually only matters when there's a crisis or maybe to help avert a crisis, right? If everything's great, you don't need parents. Right? If food just magically appeared on the table uh, and law and order ruled the day among men, you wouldn't need parents. But you need parents because there are needs and there are crises. There are moments that call up the need of the parent to be present, to be available, to be plugged in, to be turned on, to be aware of what's happening in the home, and to be involved with the dynamics. It's the same in a church. If everything was just automatically wonderful then we don't have to worry about taking heed to ourselves. The fact that we're told to take heed to ourselves means things won't automatically, by their own natural course, be wonderful. What does it take to have a church that is wonderful? It takes people who are committed to taking heed to themselves. People who are committed to the responsibilities that they have been given 
and taking that very dutifully, very responsibly. People who are not distracted with other things, people who are not negligent of important things, but people who are plugged in and available and aware and knowing through compassion, service, love, and grace towards one another how best to minister to and serve one another. And so as a church, that's the big idea this morning, right? Especially for those of us as adults who already have these responsibilities, but even more so for the children who are learning either from our example what to do or what not to do, right? Wisdom crieth in the streets, as Adam has covered very well in Sunday school, right? She's speaking in the gates, right? I mean, so when you think about wisdom speaking in the gates, what does that mean? Where, what happened in the gates of the city? It's where business was done. That's where transactions took place, right? So if you go down to the county courthouse and sit in, on a few divorce cases, on a few custody cases, on a few um, theft and robbery cases, on drug cases. You just sit in and you observe, you know, as what's happening in the gates of the city. Wisdom's crying out. If you don't want your marriage to end like this, pay attention. If you don't want your children to be turned out like that, pay attention. If you don't want a community that looks like this, pay attention, right? If, if you want things to go a certain way, wisdom's not hidden in a secret place. It's crying out. And what's it crying out? I think it's crying out, pay attention. Wake up. Get engaged. Plug in. Stop making excuses. Just plug in and make it happen, right? That's what is needed. And so when we look at this story with her, you have to at least ask the fair question, um, you know, how do you go from her to nowhere? How do, you, how do you go from being the guy to just being, he's not even spoken of. He didn't ever even made an appearance, never even so much as an opposition, right? At least a lot, for all the problems a lot had, at least he had some form of a hot opposition to wickedness. Uh, her doesn't even make an appearance. He's not even seen, and, uh, and there's, there's maybe good reason for that. But as far as we're concerned, we don't know what those are. And I think there's a lot to be learned from just the fact that, one, always take heed to yourself because if we're trusting ourselves or trusting other people too explicitly, the Lord can show us that's not very wise. I think Moses trusted her and Aaron. And nobody was more surprised, I'm sure, than Moses to find that after just being gone for 40 days, when he returned, not only had the people corrupted themselves, that didn't surprise Moses. Moses knew these people. That's not a surprise. What was a surprise was that the people he trusted to be responsible had so miserably failed as to even put up resistance. Aaron, because he was standing alone, her was silent as the dead, but in either case, ineffective. So I would say don't be like Aaron. I would say don't be like her. I would say quit ye like men, stand fast in the faith, contending for the faith, contending for what's right, trusting in the Lord who is able to hold us up. And maybe the people needed to learn some things. All those things happened for our learning as well. And I think that's an important element of truth that need not be glazed over. That you can go from a hilltop victory to a crisis and you just disappear because you don't want to get involved or it's going to be hard to be involved. Or, and I don't know how many times this has proven to be true from your own experience as a parent or what have you. Um, but most of the time, the best way forward lies on the other side of a really tough conversation you don't want to have. And you've got to have it. It's not good enough to just ignore it, avoid it, and be silent as her. Amen. Brother Josh, if you'll come this morning, let's all stand. To our